It's good to see everyone this morning. Missed being with y'all last week. If you kind of like me not being here, that's just a taste of the next three weeks. <laughs> um, I appreciate uh, Luke teaching my Bible class for me, and he's going to be taking care of that task uh, when I'm away. And I appreciate Ron uh, bringing the lessons for me last Sunday. From what I understand, he has began a series, um, some might call a devilish series, devilish series that will continue throughout the month of July. It sounded better in my head before I said it, so. But he's done a very good job in the first two lessons. I looked at those, and um, he's got many more that he'll be bringing during the course of July, and definitely dealing with the subject of the devil and how the devil works, so you don't want to miss those. Let's see, what we're going to be looking at this morning it is, some might say, a concept that, that I, I have great experience in. And that is an experience of stumbling. Now, not physically, granted. When I was a young person being raised, I was a very clumsy child. I mean, and, and that somewhat has lasted in adulthood. I've just learned to be a bit more careful. But oftentimes, whenever we think of stumbling... We associate with stumbling when you're walking and maybe you trip over a curb, but you don't always fall, okay? You'll, you'll stumble in step, but you quickly recover sometimes. There is a spiritual concept of stumbling, and I say spiritual concept because in reality, it's not only manifested spiritually, but physically, where the Bible talks about us stumbling, or better yet, a goal to be not to stumble, Turn over to 2 Peter, if you would, chapter 1 for a few minutes this morning. Let's begin there. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning there in verse 10. The apostle Peter, in establishing the necessary qualities that we as Christians are to have within our lives, talks about the benefit of possessing these qualities. Uh, notice with me in 2 Peter 1, verse 10. He says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Okay? You will never stumble. Now, the Greek word that's translated here as stumble can mean um, to stumble as we talk about, but it also can mean to fall, can mean to offend, can mean literally to trip. And so whenever we look at the Bible and we see the warnings against stumbling, it's not simply a, a minor misstep. It's an actual fall. You know, think of a stumbling block, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the lesson, where something is in front of you, and you trip over it, and it brings you completely to the ground. It is this idea that the Bible says that if we seek to make our calling and election sure, then we will never stumble. We will never fall. We will never trip. And depending on the, the passage and the context, we will never offend. Now, there's a couple of Bible passages that use this Greek word. Turn with me first off to Romans chapter 11, verse 11. The Apostle Paul, in talking to the brethren in Rome, he says there in Romans 11, verse 11, and, and talking about Israel now, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, in the context here, notice he references Israel's stumbling and then Israel's falling. Now, he doesn't say that they stumbled so that they might fall, but, they, but what happened as a result of their falling was the Gentiles being brought into the fold. But notice the idea of stumbling. And when you look at Israel's histories, he's not talking about minor missteps. He's talking about full-on falling away from the Lord. Notice in James chapter 2, verse 10. James chapter 2, verse 10, we see this Greek word again. And in this particular context, that woke me up. Sorry. <laughs> okay. James chapter 2, verse 10, he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. Not a misstep, but an actual violation, a breaking, doing something that is wrong wrong. Then over in chapter 3 of James verse 2. James chapter 3 verse 2, note there he says, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. 
They're acknowledging that as much as we try, that there are going to be times that we are going to be tempted to stumble and have stumbled. And maybe we will stumble. But it's the idea of, as I said, it's not a simple misstep. It is a sin. It is where we stumble, we fall, we trip, we offend. And so as Christians, it should be our goal. Bear with me for just a minute. We're coming up on the 4th of July, but no. Okay. <clears throat> Whenever we think about this stumbling, we need to keep in mind that it is serious business. That it is that which separates us from God. It is the sin. Now, so then we come back to the passage we started the lesson with in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Now let's bring that back into consideration, having looked at the other instances. He says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now it's interesting because James acknowledges that with our weaknesses, we probably will stumble, but yet Peter tells us how to live our lives so that we may never stumble, so that we may never fall. And so what we're going to do with this morning's lesson in considering what it means to stumble is ask the question, what causes a person to stumble? You know, think about this for a minute. What can cause a person to stumble? Well, in principle, it would be a stumbling block. Anything that would hinder a person's walking. Let's say you're walking through a trail. Have you ever gone through a trail in woods and you're not paying attention and you trip over a root that's grown up out of the ground? Any type of thing that would hinder our service unto the Lord. Matter of fact, there are three different references in the New Testament to a stumbling block I want to draw your attention to. It is interesting that in two of these passages, we're going to Romans 14 verse 13, in two of these passages, he's talking about your, your being a stumbling block to someone else. Notice in Romans 14, verse 13. He says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause, a, cause to fall in a brother's way. Think about that. He says that we should be living our lives with one another and our relationship with one another, that we don't put a stumbling block or we don't put a cause to fall in one another's way. Now, in the context here, we're talking about liberty. Recognize that. Someone may feel something is wrong when in reality it is, it is proper, it is acceptable, but you don't force them to violate their conscience. The same thought is seen in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. We've seen the same idea of stumbling block in relationship to an individual's liberty. Let's look at that for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Note with me there in verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul in the context here. He says, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? All right, so it's the same idea. And many times when we talk about not stumbling, we need to stop and make sure that we ourselves are not stumbling blocks to other people. Now, notice what he says to the church of Pergamos, though. Let's turn over real quick to, to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Over in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, we see the idea again of a stumbling block. This time differently. Differently than what we just looked at where you might cause a brother to stumble. Here he's talking about the whole church being caused to stumble. Revelation 2 verse 14, he says, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. What did Balaam do? Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Now there are a couple different ways you can look at this verse in reference to what was going on at Pergamos. Uh, one reference could be that actually there was someone there trying to get the brethren to engage in eating things offered to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Or he's talking about someone who's trying to cause the church to stumble, to fall, just as Balaam had done with Israel. Balaam said it's okay to eat things offered to idols. It's okay to engage in sexual immorality. In any case, though, depending on what was going on, it doesn't matter. The point is, 
Someone was there trying to put a stumbling block before the congregation, trying to get members to trip, to fall, to offend, to turn away from the Lord. And so when we think about this, what causes us to stumble, I would suggest that there are three categories that we could look at this morning. Three categories that we could group or lump stumbling or cause us to stumble within. The first thing I like is called distractions. Because think about whenever you trip and fall. In your normal course of life, you're walking. Many times we become distracted by what's around us and we don't see the path that's laid out before us. Our lives as Christians should be a path laid out to heaven that we walk. The problem is, though, is whenever we walking this path, we are distracted by the various things that are around us. The next thing we know, we have deviated from the path or we have completely fallen. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. There are three things listed within this passage. Four, if we separate what verse 15 says from the three things found in verse 16, four things that could distract us from our service unto God. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. That could be considered the first distraction. Loving the world, loving the things that are in the world. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All right, for all that is in the world. Here comes the distraction, the lust of the eyes. Many times sin develops within our lives because we are distracted by the lust of the eyes, by the things that we see, being attracted, being drawn away by those things. He says there, and I skipped one, the lust of the flesh. That is another thing that oftentimes will distract individuals away from God. They become overwhelmed by their fleshly desires, desires that are conflicting with the word of God, and they're distracted by that, and they follow those instead. Then he says there in verse 16 that he lists the pride of life. How many times has the vainglory or the pride of life distracted a Christian from their pursuit of serving God? One might say Diotrephes was one who was distracted by having preeminence, or more to the point of wanting preeminence. We have to recognize, that like, they, like putting horses, or horses on a blinder, put blinders on a horse to keep the horse from being distracted, there are times that we need to make certain that we are not distracted by the things of the world, by the lust of the flesh, by the lust of the eyes, by the pride of life. Keep our eyes on the go. Sometimes we are even distracted by fear. Think about that for a minute, by fear. Notice what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, referencing a spirit, if you would, that we do not have. 2 Timothy chapter 1, there in verse 7, the apostle Paul, he says, Fear God, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we have proper fear for God, we will not have the fear that the world would have. We would not even have fear of the world. We don't have the, the spirit of fear. Someone says, well, give us an example of this fear hindering an individual. Well, think about Peter. Remember when Peter was walking on the water and he was distracted by the storms that were raging around him? He looked away and he sank. And it's interesting that that may have been kind of a tale in his life of what was to come later. Because over in Matthew chapter 26 there, verses 69 through 75, here we have Peter. His time has come. He's about to be asked to give a defense for why he has been with this man. So what happens? He's in the courtyard and a servant girl comes up to him and says, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. How did he respond? He says, I don't know what you're saying. You've got me confused. I, I don't know this guy. So a little bit later, another girl saw him. And this girl said, this fella also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, I know him. I saw him. And Peter says, I don't know the man. Now, come on, Peter, twice. Surely at some point it's going to click within your mind what you're doing. A little bit later, someone else came up. 
And they said, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. And that was it. Peter had had enough. He says, I don't know the man. He cursed and he swore. Why did Peter do this? This was the same man who, when they were sitting around dinner, or around the table earlier, said, Lord, I'll die for you. There's no way I'm going to be offended because of you. There's no way I'm going to be caused to fall because of you. He said, I'll die for you. But we see in this case in point a spirit of fear within Peter's life. And for a moment, th th this man who said, I'll die for you, was distracted. Now, let me tell you what, if it can happen to Peter, it can happen to any of us at any moment. Later in Peter's life, in Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 13, we find there that Paul had to rebuke Peter because he gave in to fear when those of the circumcision was coming with James. Peter separated himself from the Gentiles, and the hypocrisy was so great that even Barnabas was caught up in it. All because he feared for a moment those who were those of the circumcision. What does Jesus say about this, though? Jesus says over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, he puts everything into proper perspective regarding who we are to fear and who we are not to fear. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He says, But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Brethren, it happens so quick, so fast. You get in a hurry. That's when I'll tend to fall is when I get in a hurry. And I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, my steps I'm taking. Next thing you know, I'll trip and I'll stumble. Now that's physically. What about spiritually? If it could happen to Peter, if he could fall to a spirit of fear, then what about us today? That's why, Pete, that's why Paul tells us over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He lets us know right off the bat that the sins that we face are not unique. That you cannot say, well, no one knows what I'm going through. You let them go what I went through and they would have done the same thing. Notice what he says. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Your mom always said you were special. When it comes to sin, you're no different than anybody else. Every temptation you face, everybody else has also faced. You're not unique in that respect. And so he says there, no temptation is overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted, but what you, let me read that, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. See, we don't have to sin. We will face temptation, but we don't have to give in. We just have to look for the escape. We have to have our eyes open. We have to see the stumbling block in our path before we get there and go around it. And if it rears its ugly head in front of us, we simply step over it. We don't allow ourselves to stumble. Another type of stumbling block, in addition to distractions, would be deceptions. Think about that. Sometimes it's not distractions that cause Christians to fall, it's deceptions. Matter of fact, Paul, although the context is a bit different, if you'll look in Romans chapter 7, verse 11, in reflecting upon his life as a younger person, that while still under the Mosaic law, he observes for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Sin is very, very, very deceptive. But you know that already. But I would suggest that there's even a greater danger out there of deception. And that is of self. Where we end up deceiving ourselves. Galatians chapter 6 verses 3 through 4. The Apostle Paul gives the Galatians instructions regarding their responsibility to help one another. Especially if a brother has been overtaken in a fault. There in Galatians 6 verse 1, he says, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Now verse 2, he says, Bear one another's burdens and so forth that fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 3, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, 
he deceives himself. We never use, we should never use our opportunities to help our brothers a way of inflating our ego and, and lifting ourselves up. We're simply doing what the Lord has done for us. And so we sit down and we help an individual. But if we think ourselves to be something when we are nothing, we deceive ourselves. So then verse 4, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Deception. James chapter 1, 26. Again, we see a reference here to a self-deception. James 1, verse 26, James says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. There are so many things that can deceive us. But I think we are our greatest dangers at time because we can deceive ourselves. You know, you, you may be able to spot someone who's, who's trying to sell you snake oil. But sometimes if we try to sell it to ourselves, we're willing to buy it because we've reasoned it within our hearts. This self, this self deception is dangerous, dangerous. It allows us to listen to our emotions and to be driven by our emotions. It allows us to listen to our desires and our wishes. And we end up justifying things because it's what we want to do. We cannot allow ourselves to be taken down by that stumbling block. We can't do it. And of course, their deception by others, false teachers, the influence of others, and so forth. We could talk hours about that. But the point is, in our life as Christians, there are going to be stumbling blocks. We are going to be tempted. We are going to be tempted by the things of the world. But the question is, will we spot it and avoid it and not allow ourselves to fall? The third thing, the third category of stumbling blocks is discouragement. Have you ever known a Christian to give up because they were discouraged? I have. And there are a lot of things in life that discourages us, a lot of things. Now, in this area, it may be that you are facing greater things than I am. Therefore, the level of discouragement could be potentially greater within your life than maybe in mine or maybe vice versa. Think about Elijah for just a moment. You remember the story? Elijah was running after this great battle at Caramel and the victory that God had given him on that mountain. He was running from Jezebel, fleeing for his life. And he had he journeyed all day, just, just run and run and run. In 1 Kings 19, verse 4, he's done. He's done. He says, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father. Can you imagine that level of discouragement? Now, I'm not saying Eli Elijah was sinning. Understand that, okay? But it's an example of being willing to give up because of this great discouragement that fell upon him. What about Jesus? Can it be said that Jesus suffered a lot? Well, sure. As a matter of fact, not only had he suffered greatly before the garden, he knew he was going to suffer more. So much so that he said, if it be your will, Father, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was coming. But yet we never once see Jesus giving up. Hebrews chapter 12 uses that as an example to tell us not to become discouraged. Hebrews chapter 12, note with me there in verse 3. He says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. We are going to be discouraged at times. We are going to face these heavy anchors that are pulling us down into the depths of sorrow. But what we need to do is to keep the faith. Seek edification. Seek encouragement from one another. You know, if you feel like that, that you're at your wit's end and you can't keep on keeping on, then call a brother or sister. Sit down with them. Be edified. Be encouraged. Let's, and oftentimes when you talk to someone, you get a bit of a different perspective on things. And you realize that maybe it's not as bad as what you were thinking. And be willing to offer encouragement. Over in Hebrews 12, let's go a little farther in the chapter, verses 12 through 15. I'm not exactly certain if the Hebrew writer here was speaking of discouragement, but it could be a cause. 
He says in Romans, uh, Hebrews 12, beginning there in verse 12, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Maybe this should have been the actual verse the lesson was founded upon. Did you see the various wordings within that? He says, look carefully. Earlier he said, make straight paths for your feet. But verse 15, look carefully, lest anyone fall short, fall, notice that, of the grace of God. Lest any root, I talked about roots tripping us, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this many become defiled. The truth and the reality is, is that there are going to be stumbling blocks. There are going to be times that we are going to face these stumbling blocks. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what do we do if we stumble? What do we do if we stumble? It's better, better to prevent it. But if you find yourself face down in sin, what do you do? Well, think about Peter for just a moment. Peter, uh, Matthew 26, 69 through 75, we had referenced that earlier. Peter had denied the Lord. He had said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'll die for you. But yet he denied the Lord three times. Look there towards the end of the text, around verses 74 and 75. What does it say Peter did? Specifically in 75. Let's, let's bring that one up, John, there. He remembered the words that Jesus had said. And then Matthew 26, 75, so he went out and wept bitterly. And what did Peter do after that? He got up, went on preaching the gospel. Day of Pentecost, he publicly pro proclaimed his faith in Jesus Christ. And by tradition, he ultimately died a martyr, being crucified upside down, supposedly, because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, when you look at the end of the Gospel of John, I believe it is, G uh, the Lord has a discussion with Peter about his death. But what about Judas? Remember Judas Iscariot? He betrayed Jesus. You know, Peter denied him, but Judas betrayed him and sold him for 30 pieces of silver. You'll note there Matthew 27, verses 3 and 5. Or notice there in verse 3. Start there. He brings the money back. He's remorseful. And he brings the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priests and back to the elders. And he says to them in verse 4, you know, he says, I have betrayed, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So they said, you know, what is that to us? You see to it. So what did he do? Did he go out like Peter and weep bitterly and then pick himself back up? No, he hanged himself. He gave up. Discouragement, despair, guilt took him down all the way. And instead of doing like Peter did, repenting and bringing himself back up, he killed himself. If we sin, brethren, if we sin, we only have one recourse. If we allow ourselves to, to fall, if we allow ourselves to stumble, if we're walking along and not paying one bit of attention and we stumble over the stumbling block, there's only one thing that we, only one thing we can do. 1 John 2, beginning in verse 1. My little children, I, he says, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the whole world. What do we do when we fall? What do we do if we stumble? We get up. We ask God to forgive us because Jesus Christ is our advocate. We forgive ourselves. We learn from the lesson. We learn from the fall. And we continue on serving God. There are going to be times in our lives, and, and, and you know, I don't ever want to say that we have to sin because I don't think man has to sin. But I know we are going to face temptations. And James acknowledges we are going to stumble. So the question is, if that happens to you, don't give up. You pick yourself up and you get back on the road.
Quickly, how do you avoid stumbling? Well, you turn the light on, so to speak. 1 John 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you walk in darkness, you're going to fall. Ephesians 5, verse 8 tells us to walk as children of light. And with the light on, we need to be watchful. We need to keep our eyes open, look ahead at us, at what we are living, where we are going. In Ephesians chapter 6, note with me there in verse 8, the apostle Paul to the Ephesians. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. Being watchful to this end. Over in 2 Timothy. Note with me there in verse 4, or chapter 4, that is verse 5. The Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy says, But you be watchful in all things, endure inflictions. And he continues there. But be watchful in all things. And then lastly, 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Peter, when he's talking to the brethren there, those, the pilgrims of the dispersion, he tells them in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. There would be no video of me falling on YouTube had I slowed down and took one step at a time coming up this platform. Now that's a physical fall. There would be no sin within our past if we would simply watch where we go. But we haven't, and so there is sin. And God has forgiven us of those sins because we obeyed the gospel's call. But what about today and what about tomorrow? When we walk out these doors, are you going to have your eyes open, looking ahead, walking in the light, always being watchful, always being careful? Yes. What are you going to do if you stumble over a stumbling block? Pick yourself up, learn the lesson, ask God to forgive you, and get back after it. If you're not a Christian, you need to become a child of God. You don't need to let anything hinder you from obeying the gospel's call into salvation. Right now, there are a bunch of walls, not simple stumbling blocks, but there are walls out there that would want to prevent you from obeying the gospel's call. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can become a Christian this morning. If you're willing to repent of your sins, turn away from your sinful, sinful past, you can do that this morning. If you're ready to make the public confession according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, you can do that this morning. And then if you'll obey his command to be baptized, Mark 16, 16, you'll rise up then to walk in the newness of life. Why? Because you've believed, you've turned away, and you've made that public confession. If you're willing to do that, let's do that today and arise to walk in the newness of life. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. How many stumbling blocks are there in your life? And have you gotten so used to falling over them that you've just not even, you've quit counting, you've quit taking thought? If so, then it's time to repent and ask God to forgive you. And let's get back on the road to fellowship with our Heavenly Father this morning. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.